Thank you very much, Alan. And I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Gopal Prasad, Rapinchuk, Suri, and uh, Alexi Trala. I have put in a queue because it should be in a sequence, the QRST. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know the previous talk was so, so deep and very beautiful and so the audience needs something light and fluffy and that is will be provided here uh, the <clears throat> yeah uh, by the way before going on i would like to express my thanks to professor gopal prasad you know he uh, I learned a lot of the mathematics that I know from him. When I was a graduate student in the Tata Institute, um, there were three people from whom I, with whom I used to talk a lot, Raghunathan, Gopal, and Nori. <clears throat> and uh, because of Gopal, actually, I got started on my thesis. So my thesis problem was suggested by him. And even prior to this, there was a question by <clears throat> uh, Zimmer. Uh, whether if you have a higher rank uh, arithmetic group, uh, a subgroup which is almost normal, whether that has finite index or not. And nowadays it's called the Margulis Zimmer conjecture. And he suggested that I work on this. But I had reduced it to a statement on unipotent generators. And so I'm very glad that uh, I can report on this now. <clears throat> So the talk will be about unipotent generators for arithmetic groups or higher rank arithmetic groups. But just to uh, explain the kind of results uh, I want to consider, I will start with a non-example. <clears throat> so let's start with a subgroup uh, of SL2Z of finite index. The elementary subgroup of uh, gamma uh, is the subgroup of gamma, which is generated by the upper and lower triangular matrices. Uh, so I will denote them uh, U plus intersect gamma and U minus intersect gamma. These are upper triangular matrices in gamma, and these are lower triangular matrices in gamma. <clears throat> so for example, uh, suppose I take the principal congruent subgroup of level M in SL2Z, that is all matrices A, B, C, D, such that this matrix is congruent to the identity matrix modulo M. So it's clear that the upper triangular matrices in this group uh, is just this one M zero one and one zero M one. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the issue is whether uh, groups like this can have finite index and uh, of course, as one knows, uh, if M is greater than or equal to three, then this delta has infinite index in gamma. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, let me just uh, sketch a proof here. I mean, it's not really a sketch and de describe what the proof entails. So you look at the boundary on the upper half plane, in P1 of R. So you have this subgroup one M zero one, <clears throat> one zero, M1. So these two uh, play ping pong on P1 of R, and the attracting elements are the point at infinity and the point at zero. And so <clears throat> on a large open set in P1 of R, the group generated by this operates properly discontinuously. And therefore, this cannot have finite index. This cannot be a lattice. If it were a lattice, uh, all the orbits here would be dense. And uh, you see, <clears throat> this kind of argument can be extended to any rank one group, real rank one group. I'll come to that. So, but if I move to higher rank, a theorem of Jacques Fitz is that if gamma is a subgroup of infinite index, uh, excuse me, finite index in SL and Z, then the subgroup uh, delta of gamma generated by upper and lower triangular matrices, uh, which are unipotent, this has finite index. The proof by Tits uses uh, something. 
this subgroup uh, delta contains a smaller subgroup, which is uh, normalized by gamma and is generated by unipotent. Such a normal subgroup uh, that, that has finite index was uh, proved by Bas Miller say, uh, using the congruence group uh, property for epsilon zero. <clears throat> So we are going to do something similar. Uh, so this group SL2Z is a lattice in the real rank one group, SL2R, where, uh, whereas for n greater than or equal to three, this uh, group SL and Z is a lattice in a higher rank group. That is the difference in this. So this uh, theorem of states admits a generalization. This is the result I want to talk about. So suppose G is a connected linear semi-simple algebraic group defined over, over the rationals. And I'm going to assume that G is Q-simple. That is to say, the only connected normal algebraic subgroups of G, excuse me, which are defined over Q, which are defined over Q, are the whole group and the trivial group. I forgot to add defined over Q. The only connected normal algebraic subgroups which are defined over Q and are in G, a G and the trivial group. This is equivalent to saying that the group of integer points is an irreducible lattice. <clears throat> so I'm going to assume also that the group G has higher real rank, that the real rank is at least two. And I'm going to assume that the Q rank is greater than or equal to one. I need unipotent elements. So this is another assumption. So this assumption is equivalent to the following conditions, uh, any one of these conditions, that the quotient GR by GZ is uh, under the quotient topology is non-compact. The arithmetic lattice GZ has unipotent elements. And finally, that the group G has a proper parabolic subgroup P defined over Q. These are all equivalent. <clears throat> So let's then fix a proper parabolic Q subgroup with unipotent radical U plus. And I'm going to denote by U minus the opposite unipotent radical. I haven't defined it precisely, but uh, uh, let me just sort of sketch what that is. So if I have a parabolic subgroup, this contains uh, maximal You split torus. And I have this uh, Levy decomposition and the unipotent uh, radical of P. So the Lie algebra of the unipotent radical is a direct sum of the root spaces, uh, so certain roots, alpha lies in a certain subspace uh, S, the set of roots. So I could take the uh, U minus to be the sum of negative root, root spaces with the same set. And the analytic subgroup corresponding to this is in fact an algebraic unipotent subgroup defined over Q. And this U minus times M is called the opposite parabolic. <clears throat> and so that U minus is, will be called the opposite unipotent value. So this is the theorem I want to prove. With these assumptions that the uh, real rank is at least two, that's important. Uh, and the Q rank is greater than or equal to one. Uh, suppose I have a subgroup gamma of uh, finite index, then the elementary subgroup uh, of gamma generated by U plus intersect gamma and U minus intersect gamma has finite index <coughs> in gamma. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, result was known in a large number of cases. Uh, there is a paper by this in the Panther on you, uh, 1976, I think, where he proves this same thing for Chevalier groups or number fields. But he assumes there that the K rank is at least <clears throat> and then uh, Wasserstein uh, had announced a proof for classical groups of higher rank, uh, that is K rank greater than equal to two or number fields. But I have not seen his proof because it was a research announcement. I don't know if uh, it was eventually published or something. Wasserstein. Sorry? He said for higher rank groups, this uh, elementary subgroup is arithmetic. I don't think it's published. You know. I thought I would ask you. <laughs> anyway, so the, in general, this result is due to Raghunathan and myself. We did some complementary cases. <clears throat> so, but uh, there is a very different uh, result which uses, in fact, different techniques, but the result looks rather similar. That is due to he O, and Benoit and O in a bunch of papers they did some more cases, and Benoit and Michael, uh, who finally did all the cases, who proved that suppose I have a zeris cadence uh, discrete subgroup or the group of real points, uh, this G is a higher rank group. So if I have a zeris cadence discrete subgroup which is generated by lattices in opposing unipotent radicals of uh, real parabolic subgroups. Now I'm not taking parabolic sources, but over, uh, over reals. Then this uh, gamma is a lattice. You know, that's what we're saying, that the elementary subgroup is a lattice. <clears throat> Again, in the higher rank case, but uh, from what I see from their papers, that proof actually uses this result because what you do is sort of put a um, put a compatible Q structure on these unipotent radicals, and then show that these unipotent radicals are in unipotent radicals of a parabolic group defined over Q. <clears throat> So uh, the reason I'm talking about this, it's a little bit embarrassing because uh, it's a very old result, you know, in 94 or something. But the uh, proof, uh, recently I got some proof, which was, uh, there was a lot of sim simplification of the original proof. But uh, when, I, when Rappenchuk asked me to give a talk here, I said, I don't have anything new. He said, oh, it's okay, you can talk about this. So, I took him at his word. <laughs> so this earlier proof by Raghunath and myself was quite general, but in the Q rank one case, uh, you know, it followed closely Raghunathan's proof of the uh, centrality of the congruence subgroup kernel. And that centrality used the uh, uh, sort of an SU21 reduction, which was actually quite involved. It, uh, it's a, uh, case-by-case case check for uh, algebraic groups defined over number fields. It's not so, uh, not so easy, actually. It's quite involved. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't simply use classification over C, but classification over number fields of, uh, of isotropic algebraic groups. <clears throat> so the proof that I have now is kind of uniform and then perhaps shorter. I've made a strong claim it is much shorter. <laughs> and it uses uh, some embedded SL2 in place of this SU21, but that embedded SL2 is provided by the jacobson morozov theorem, uh, about which I would not say much. So the Q, in the Q rank one case, uh, one more, uh, mm, Know, point to sell this proof is that uh, in the Q rank one case uh, in the earlier paper, we used the Artin reciprocity law quite a bit, 
But this proof only uses the Dirichlet theorem on the infinitude of, infinitude of primes in arithmetic progression. But as I said before, if I take the <clears throat> real rank of this group uh, to be one, then for most congruent subgroup, the elementary subgroup has infinite index. In this sense, the statement is always false for uh, rank one groups. So the proof is quite analogous. Instead of uh, the projective space, you look at G mod P, where P is a minimal parabolic group defined over R. And on this, the elementary subgroup for, for a deep enough congruence level, it operates properly discontinuously on, a, on an open set. But the reason is the following. Uh, in the rank one case, in the real rank one case, a unipotent belongs to exactly one parabolic subgroup. So every unipotent has only one fixed point. So that's the reason why this works. <clears throat> uh, once again, this proof also gives the centrality of the congruence of the kernel in the non-uniform case. This was due to Raghunathan. And once the centrality is proved, uh, if you assume some extra hypothesis that the group be simple connected, the finiteness of the congruence subgroup kernel was initially proved by Raghunathan, but Gopal gave a really nice proof, very nice proof. And then the precise computation of this congruence subgroup kernel was also done by, uh, by all these people. <clears throat> uh, and Rapinchuk told me that he has a proof of the centrality of the congruence subgroup kernel. He doesn't even use this. Um, um, Dirichlet theorem, it's almost uh, just some uh, calculation in the chaotic completion. <clears throat> so let me get back to the uh, proof of this main theorem. So we are going to reduce this uh, uh, theorem that the elementary subgroup is generated by u plus synthetic gamma and u minus synthetic gamma to uh, a Another result, which uh, which I will explain. So let's start with a. This time I want to fix a maximal parabolic Q subgroup. Fix something which is maximal, with uh, unipotent radical u, and a Levy decomposition uh, p equals m times u, and take the opposite as before, u minus times m, and. Uh, this Fm denotes not quite the elementary subgroup, but elementary subgroup extended by the congruence subgroup of the Levy part, M. So instead of the elementary group, I have thickened it a little bit. I have added the congruence subgroup of the Levy part. So one can, uh, you know, instead of uh, making difficult calculations, one can straight away appeal to some results of uh, Madhav Nori and uh, or Weisweiler, which says that if you have a Zariski dense subgroup like Fm, then there is a smallest congruent subgroup of Gz which contains this. The collection of congruent subgroups of Gz which contains such a Zariski dense subgroup is finite. Sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> uh, so there is a smallest such group call it the congruence closure of Fm, that is gamma sub m. And this gamma sub m is, uh, uh, is a congruence group, so in particular, it's an arithmetic group. So what this theorem says is that in the higher rank case, the uh, thickened elementary sub, uh, subgroup Fm contains the commutator subgroup of this arithmetic group. So now we know that the congruence of this is a congruence group, it's an arithmetic group. And we are in the case of a higher rank uh, group, uh, which and gamma m is an irreducible lattice. So the commutator has finite index. So this is the commutator is arithmetic also. 
but then fm is also arithmetic uh, but you see the elementary group I, we are trying to prove that the elementary group has finite index but this elementary group is normalized by this second elementary group so what it shows is that if I know fm is an arithmetic group, then this normal subgroup also is arithmetic. But this we prove only for maximal parabolic, this kind of thing. But you see, the elementary group corresponding to a maximal one is smaller than elementary group corresponding to any other parabolic. Because if you have a parabolic Q contained in P, then the unipotent radical of Q contains the unipotent radical of P. So we will have the inclusion of unipotent radicals, which shows that the uh, elementary subgroup of Q contains the elementary subgroup of P. And we know already that this is arithmetic, and therefore so is this. So this proves the theorem in general. If I am able to prove that the uh, this second elementary subgroup, Fn, contains the commutator subgroup. <clears throat> so the way we are going to prove this uh, is to prove the centrality of a certain kernel. And uh, much of the work is in uh, establishing some properties of this uh, kernel or of the completion in which the kernel lies. Yeah. And now I want to prove theorem two. I want to reduce it to uh, centrality of something. So I'm going to assume that the uh, parabolic subgroup P is maximal. And we have this opposite parabolic. So the first step in the proof is to uh, equip G of Q with a topology. This topology is given by the system of uh, elementary group Fm, which was uh, generated by the congruent subgroup, E plus minus M. So we designate this family to be a fundamental system of neighborhoods of identity. Uh, yeah, I'll come, yeah, let me go back to this. See, what we know is that this thickened arithmetic group, this the thickened um, uh, elementary group, contains this commutator subgroup. Suppose I know this. I'll prove that. that is, if it contains this, then this is arithmetic, so this is arithmetic. But this uh, arithmetic group normalizes something, so that something, the elementary group is also arithmetic. But that is the elementary group corresponding to a maximal parabolic subgroup. That such an elementary group is contained in everything. Else. <clears throat> so for a maximal one, we are going to define a fundamental system of neighborhoods of identity like this. Just call them open subgroups. Okay. And then uh, by left translation, you get a fundamental system of neighborhoods of any element of GQ. So uh, when we want to uh, define a completion in a group uh, with respect to such a fundamental system of neighborhoods, which are subgroups, uh, this is the standard procedure. You Let's say a sequence is a Cauchy sequence if uh, given any integer m greater than or equal to 1, there is an integer capital K, which depends on m, such that uh, GK inverse of GL is small, uh, is contained in Fm. This is the usual definition of a Cauchy sequence. So if, uh, um, let's say that two Cauchy sequences are equivalent if given this level M, 
there exists an integer k such that these two differ by an element of the small group fn. So given these uh, Cauchy sequences, let's say GK and HK are two Cauchy sequences, you can form the product sequence GK, HK, and the inverse sequence GK inverse. Now the question would be, are these sequences Cauchy or not? It's not very clear. The product sequence and the inverse sequence may not be Cauchy. So here is a theorem which says that they are indeed Cauchy, provided you are in higher rank. It's somehow a very peculiar thing that the higher you need the assumption of higher rank even to consider the completion as a topological group. So the set of equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences then becomes a topological group in a natural fashion. So that is the product of two Cauchy sequences is the Cauchy sequence of the product. And the inverse of a Cauchy sequence is the Cauchy sequence corresponding to the inverse. And when you have this uh, completion uh, of G, uh, this will have a surjective homomorphism. Actually, it's, it's an open map, I forgot. It's an open map with kernel capital K, let's say. So uh, what's more, in the higher rank case, this kernel capital K is central in this topological group. So there are two, uh, uh, two parts of the theorem, both of which use higher rank, that the set of Cauchy sequences form a topological group. Already you need the higher rank assumption. And secondly, in the higher rank case, this kernel is central. Much of the work is uh, about uh, proving the centrality of this. <clears throat> so as I said, the higher rank assumption is used by. So I'm, I want to give, uh, you know, I want to say that the earlier theorem that the group FM contains the commutator subgroup of this congruence closure is a consequence of this theorem. It's actually a fairly simple consequence, so let me give it. Excuse me. GQ bar is the completion, uh, oh yeah, the congruence completion. Completion with respect to the uh, congruence topology. Yeah, I should have stated. Yeah, with respect to this, uh, the open sets which are given by this FM. Uh, actually, it will come after the proof. It's not obvious. In fact, at this point, it's not obvious that this is locally compact even. It may not be. The, uh, I mean, I have to say, when I was looking at this, I was a little bit shocked that some uh, obvious spaces like uh, this, uh, F, the set of Cauchy sequences is not a topological group in general. In rank one, it's false. It's not true. No, no, in rank one. No, see, yeah, I think we are uh, talking that what I'm trying to say is uh, you, you are asking for this FM groups to be uh, open subgroups. But the FMs are not arithmetic groups in rank one. So that's not a problem. So for your congruence kernel, the FMs are arithmetic groups. Yeah, arithmetic completions are okay. That's not, yeah. there it's not a problem. Yeah, yeah there would not be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I know. Raghunathan told me that one needs to be careful, so he passed it on to me, this uh, wisdom. <laughs> there wasn't. I mean, I, I will explain in a minute uh, why there won't be a problem. Uh, yeah. 
uh, in the higher rank case uh, for me it won't be a problem but for in your case it won't be a problem even in rank one it's not a problem That is for the arithmetic completion, but I am considering a different completion. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me give a proof that this theorem implies the theorem that the group FM contains the commutator subgroup of its congruence closure. So suppose gamma M is the congruence closure. I take, I denote by gamma m hat the closure of gamma m and fm hat the closure of fm in this completion, uh, you know, that you got. So gamma m and fm have the same closure in the congruence completion because that was how gamma m was defined. We take the closure of fm in G, the congruence completion uh, that's an open compact subgroup. Its intersection with GQ is gamma M. <clears throat> so it follows then that the uh, this closure gamma M hat is contained in FM hat times K because their images are the same. They have the same closure in the congruence function. I, you know, I said the map is open, the map from script, the completion script G to the congruence closure is open. And therefore, you know, if you have this uh, two uh, open, uh, open subgroups, their images uh, will be closed. So now I can take commutators, gamma M hat, with gamma m hat, but that is the same as fm hat with fm hat because this k is central. Because that was the definition of gamma m. You take the closure of gamma m in the congruence completion, that's a compact open subgroup by the nori weiss feller theorem, and intersect with the GQ, you will get a congruence. That was the <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of similar. It's sort of similar. Yes. So, this uh, commutator of this congruence subgroup is contained in the commutator of its closure. But the commutator of the congruence, the disclosure gamma m hat is the same as the commutator of fm hat because that k has disappeared, k being central. <laughs> but the commutator subgroup of fm hat is contained in fm hat. So we have this inclusion. Now I intersect it back with uh, GQ. So I get that the uh, commutator subgroup for the congruence closure is contained in our group FM. One has to uh, make a small check that the uh, constant Cauchy sequences in FM are actually uh, coming from FM itself. That is GQ intersect FM hat is uh, FM. <clears throat> so this proves theorem two. So that's what we want to prove. We want to prove that the um, that uh, this admits a completion, and that in the higher rank case this kernel is central. I won't be able to tell you the centrality of the kernel in full generality. I will check this in a special case. So first, let me check that the, it does define a topology. So if you, this is the uh, lemma. If you have a system of uh, open subgroups like FM, 
and uh, I'm looking at the completion with respect to this. So this is a topological group if and only if for any FM, I take its rational conjugate that contains FM prime. Uh, something like this should be true because if I, if this were a topological group, a conjugate of a fundamental system of neighborhoods of identity should contain uh, an, an element of the fundamental system of neighborhoods of identity. So G of FM should contain FM prime. So to see how this higher rank assumption is used in this completion, I'm going to look at this G of FM for a generic element, okay, and then intersect it uh, with FM. So when I do this, this generic conjugate I can assume lies in U minus times P, the Zariski open. So I write it as U minus times P, and now uh, this contains U minus times P of PM, intersect p of minus m. Now, uh, this uh, little p is a rational element which commensurates p of m. So the conjugate of p of m by p contains some p m prime. And similarly, u minus conjugates this. So I take a kind of common m prime. So finally, what I get is that g of f m contains u minus of m of m prime z for some m prime. In the higher rank case, this group, M of Z, is infinite. That is how the higher rank is used, because the Levy part of a parabolic subgroup has uh, infinitely many elements, integral elements. <clears throat> and this allows us to prove that this uh, intersection above has many elements. And then, uh, you see, this intersection, when I change G on the right by an element of FM, nothing changes on the left side. But uh, here, U minus gets replaced by U minus of it. Uh, U minus uh, of, not of G, but G times some translate. So I get many more uh, conjugates of this group M, M of M prime. So by playing around with these conjugates, I get that this intersection G of FM intersect FM contains P minus FM for some M prime. So similarly, this conjugate contains P of M prime also. This implies that G of FM contains FM prime. And uh, by this general uh, thing, if you can only show that the fundamental system of neighborhoods of the topology is invariant under conjugation, then the existence of completion is obvious. And in your case, in the arithmetic case, such a thing is of course true. If you conjugate an arithmetic group, you get back an arithmetic group. It's not a problem. Uh, uh, this is how one proves, uh, you know, in the this first part that there is indeed a topology. Uh, we have used the fact that it's higher rank because we want, we really needed the fact that the uh, Levy part had lots of integer elements, and uh, but now. Uh, I want to prove that if the real rank is greater than or equal to two, then the kernel that uh, I'm considering here is central, and that is uh, done as follows. But I will check this only for SL2. So I'm going to check this for SL2 of the ring of integers of a number field, which has infinitely many units. So one might as well take something like this. So we have this exact sequence, 1 to k to g to g cube bar to 1. It's a congruence completion. 
and this is the essence of this. So uh, when you think about it, the something analogous to the congruence completion, this set capital K is the inverse limit of these sets. Fm, uh, the double coset of uh, gamma m by the subgroup Fm. See, uh, in some sense, we are trying to prove that these sets are finite. I don't know that yet. That's why I do not know that this capital K is even uh, locally compact. So uh, in this case, in SL2, the U plus is the upper triangular matrices, uh, and M is the group of diagonals. So M of Z2 2 is the group of diagonals whose diagonal entries are units in this ring. So this is an infinite cyclic group. And this group acts uh, by conjugation on these sets, Fm, and also on gamma of M. So it acts on all these sets and also on the kernel by inner conjugation. You know, all of G acts, and therefore uh, this subgroup also acts. So this inverse limit is compatible with this action of M of R. So the strategy is to find a fixed finite index of group D of MR, which acts trivially on each of these sets, uh, the putative finite sets. If it acts trivially on each of these sets, then it acts trivially on K. But on K, not only does M of Z zero to act, all of GQ acts. And GQ is uh, simple, uh, modular center. So this implies, that GQ acts trivially on K and therefore K is central. So this would prove the centrality. So all that we need to prove here is <coughs> that the uh, there is a fixed finite index of group capital D which acts trivially on this double coset. So to do this, let's fix an element of the double coset call it A, B, C, D, and you can assume by changing it on the right and left that C, that A is non-zero, A is non-zero. So, and I'm going to consider a diagonal element like this. So, uh, the, one of the first papers on the centrality of the congruence of the kernel was uh, Sayer's paper on SL2, exactly in this case, uh, when the Ring of integers has infinitely many units to prove that the uh, congruence of the kernel is central. He makes this computation. You take this generic element A, A B, C, D, where A is non zero, and then uh, conjugate it, and C is also non zero, excuse me, and conjugate it by uh, this diagonal element. When you do this, uh, this is the computation. I mean, it's, of course, it's very easy to prove this. Just uh, write out the matrix. Now, if U is a unit which is congruent to one modulo the ideal generated by A, then this is an integer. So this becomes an elementary matrix. Similarly here, uh, B is uh, in the ideal M. So if U is congruent to one mod A, this is an elementary matrix in delta, in EM, in fact. So the conjugate of this generic element ABCD by the diagonal element uh, is the same as the original element if U is congruent to one mod A. If, therefore, uh, if this, uh, this element S lies in a congruent subgroup, which depends on this entry A, which depends on this entry A, then it acts trivially on this coset, on this element of the coset. T is an S, sorry, thank you. Yeah, I... But you see, I can change the uh, element A somewhat. I can change this to some other, which I'll 
So if I take G prime equals G times an elementary matrix, then I'm not altering the coset. It's the same coset as before. But G prime has a different A plus B X entry. So not only does the group M sub A act, uh, fix the element G, the coset through G, this M of A plus B X also fixes the double coset. So the group M, A, B, M, generated by this collection of congruence of groups, this fixes the double coset. So uh, there is this proposition in SAS uh, which says that there exists a subgroup of finite index in MZ such that you keep varying this A, B, and M as before. This D is contained in this uh, big collection of congruence in this M, A, B, M. So the proof uses the Artin reciprocity law for the field Q root 2. Uh, it's not so immediate actually, but it's, it's a very nice proof. So this proof, del this group delta fixes every element in here and therefore acts trivially on the inverse limit of this double coset. I went back. Sorry. So the proof in general case is very similar. Uh, you have to play around with u plus and u minus. I don't want to uh, you know, bore you with too many details. So you, uh, let's recall what you are trying to prove. We are trying to prove that that uh, the kernel associated to this FM completion is central. So there is an analog of u, there is an analog of u minus, and there is an analog of m. Uh, so here is the proposition for any linear algebraic group G and a fixed integer n. Sometimes because of some SL2 embedding. I have to replace the arithmetic progression a plus bx b x by a plus bx to the n, but that's harmless. So take a linear algebra group m and a fixed integer capital N. There exists a subgroup delta of mz of finite index such that for every pair of integers a b which are co-prime and every integer m which is co-prime to this a, the group generated by this collection of congruence of groups contains delta. So it doesn't depend on this A, B, and M. So there's a fixed thing. So this proof uh, is actually a consequence of Dirichlet theorem on infinitude of primes in arithmetic progression. The point is that when I take the quotient of uh, <coughs> MZ by this full collection, uh, you will have to show that the torsion is very limited. There is very little torsion. And the limiting the torsion will involve uh, something about existence of primes in this arithmetic. In this arithmetic progression, in fact. Okay, so in the case of a diagonal torus, the result of shear would follow from the seed. The, Let's get back to this. Sorry. Let's, okay, I'll just um, state this. So in the case of the torus, uh, I had this group generated by all these congruence of groups. This is contained in M of Z. So let's call this group uh, H. Now MZ mod H is a quotient of MZ. And the order of this group is roughly P of A plus B. You know, suppose I'm working with Q instead of uh, U root 2, then it's exactly phi of A plus B. So the order of this group divides each one of these numbers, phi of A plus BX, so it divides the GCD 
Uh, so the order of the group that we want divides this full GCD. This GCD is actually bounded by a constant independent of A and B. Actually, it is divided 16. So if I want to get my group delta, I just take 16th powers of elements of MZ. That's it. This result is sort of contained in Hare's paper. So in this connection, I was just I had just asked this question. Suppose I have a positive integer and I denote by P sub n the set of polynomials of degree n uh, with rash with integer coefficients which have content one. I should have added integral coefficients here. So take this similar GCD, GCD of the phi values of instead of the linear polynomial, polynomial of degree n. So take this GCD. Is this bounded uniformly on this set PN? Very good. I'm going to say something. I don't know the answer to this question, by the way. I simply raised this. And in fact, uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was the motivation for this question. But uh, when n equals 2, the answer is yes, by a result of Sounder Rajan, who put up a paper in archive. Uh, he also shows that the result is true in general if you assume some skin cells conjecture. I think that's the one you're talking about. So if you have an irreducible polynomial content 1, uh, then there are infinitely many integers where this f evaluated at x is prime. So, thank you very much. Uh, questions for Venki? Yeah. Yeah, so if we took a rank one group with property T to sort of handle finite index for the commutator subgroup, it's, it's really this fact about the levy being compact that just that's, that, that's, so is, is that the only point where you really would? Yeah, indeed. Right? That's the only point. If we were able to prove that Levy had something, then yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions for Venki? Oh, thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> if there's no more questions, let's thank Venki once again.